back to it. You listed a number of cities there, Thomas, and uh, Vienna, Berlin, Southeast Asia, and all the all the rest. So I welcome everyone who falls into the one of those categories. Thank you very much for joining. This is our second attempt to perform this exercise virtually. We had finished that uh, wonderful event a few weeks ago and went very, very well. And because it went so well, we thought we would give it one more try. And of course, the subject is a little bit different than what we had last time. Today, we'll be talking about circular economy or more specifically about plastics. And we have one startup who is strategically placed in the middle of all of what will be taking place between the 13th and the 15th, and that would be plastic entrepreneur that is led by two individuals, Rafael Eger and Soren Lex, and they will be telling you all about their operations today and getting you ready for our great event taking place on the 13th to the 15th. So I would say, unless there was anything else, Thomas, you'd like to go ahead and add, and then we would go ahead and get started with Rafael. Okay. Rafaela, the stage is yours. <laughs> yeah, so Sarn and um, uh, welcome students. I'm happy to be here. Um, I will introduce my colleague Sarn and me is Rafaela. And yeah, we are here today to make um, first a little introduction and presentation for you. Um, so we start, Sarn, let's start. <laughs> I will try to share my screen with you. Um... You see my screen? Yes, we do. <laughs> so, um, nope, sorry. No, Rafaela will be angry with me because she is the one <laughs> who prepares all the professional <laughs> uh, presentations. Uh, but, and I need to. But, but we see every um, video call program is, is different. So we see uh, Google and um, um, Skype and so Zoom everywhere. There's another trick to open it. We okay. all need to be agile. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now the problem is that she's in in PDF and I don't know how to do full screen in PDF. But anyway, I think I have it. So should okay. Um. Uh, anyway. You uh, sir, do you want me to share it? Uh, well, it's okay. I, I have, I have it, it too. So. <laughs> I'll just do it like this. Um, you see the screen again, right? It works. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so hello from my side as well. I'm also very excited um, for the time we have now, but especially for the time um, during the Indo days then. Um, like you heard, we are actually more than two. We are four uh, in the core team. Uh, next to Rafael and me, there's also Boris and Florian, who are not here at the moment, but who will join us uh, during the time of the Indo days. Um, and in the start of the presentation, we just go a little bit about the story, where we come from, what we're doing, and basically want to use the time to answer your questions. So it all started uh, a couple of years ago because we are very passionate about what we do and we care about each other and we care about planet Earth. And a couple of years ago, I was with my wife in, in Uganda and we started uh, small projects there, microcredit projects. And in this process, we just yeah, got involved with a lot of different challenges which we face today. Uh, challenges you are probably all aware of. The main challenges we saw uh, was the unemployment rate, especially the youth unemployment rate um, and the plastic waste, which is a huge topic, plastic pollution um, everywhere. It's uh, in the media, it's, it's covered everywhere. And we, yeah, dived more into it um, and realized that in many countries of this world, there's no organized waste collection systems. Then the access to machinery, to recycling machinery is very expensive. You need a big infrastructure to set it up. You need a lot of funding for set it up. And only 9% approximately of the global plastic waste is getting recycled. And everything else, which is a lot, um, yeah, is either landfilled, lands in the oceans, gets burned, uh, whatever. And we were looking uh, to find solutions to combine these two, these two challenges. 
this unemployment and the plastic uh, waste problem or, or, or topic. Um, and Rafaela will now uh, talk a little bit about what part of our, our idea or solution is. Yes, we are a young team of um, engineers, designers, and um, yeah, creative minds who said, oh, that's, we, we have to find a solution for that. And so we developed um, small scale recycling machines. They are in circular design. And so we, they are easy to repair. They are easy to ship. They are mobile and very user friendly. So it um, doesn't need so much time to um, handle the machines and to get the plastic waste recycled. So you see the first machine, it's the shredder. There you, it's, it's yeah, only you can stand next to it. Um, you um, take the plastic waste. So um, then you have to wash it to, um, uh, to sort it and dry it. And then you put it in the shredder to make gran uh, granule out of it. And we, um, in last weeks, we developed also a manual shredder um, only used by hands or with um, some technique. And you have then an extruder. Then you put the granule um, above and you can make out um, very um, building materials. Then we have the injection machine, it's our heart. <laughs> so you put there the granulate in there and with pressure and heat, you can press a uh, new product into molds, which you can design by yourself. So for example, um, always in human centered design approach, uh, we designed, for example, in co-creation with the local community um, tiles, for example, then we have many other products which were created. So you can use um, products for um, roof tiles, um, pots, rulers, cool supplies, and many more products. So you see a, a wide var variety so, <laughs> from, um, made out of yeah, plastic waste. You see also um, Austrian startups and startups in Europe and other countries and universities and um, organizations um, cr create their own products and say, okay, this is necessary and um, get some local needs um, to um, create a social and environmental impact. So, but the machines are also only the tools. So we need also a, a social entrepreneurship education um, to um, make this knowledge ex exchange um, from how you can um, make the waste management, um, the plastic recycling, and also hmm, next. So the product design and the social business modeling. So we see, uh, yeah, to, to strive to close the loop. Next so, time. <laughs> so basically, um, what's interesting is that in yeah, the different areas where the machines and the tools are used, um, that the machines are really just the tools. And the, the I open a chat now, so uh, just the tools and everything else around the machines. And that's also something which we will discuss during the Inno days is how to basically implement or how to use the machines because that's something which is there and which works. Um, but it's much more important uh, how to implement them. So I will quickly answer the questions which are there in the chat. Um, yes, we are selling the machines basically. So we are building them, developing, selling them, but not only the machines, but all the things around. Um, we do also produce the other question is if you produce backpacks, there's a different technique. So with different machines, the soft plastic like plastic bags um, can be fused together um, so maybe we, we also prepare some pictures and some information we can send you afterwards in a presentation to see also this process. So they get fused together with an iron, for instance, and then you can sew it. Um, then the next question would be... Um, 
can this be industrial size? So the question is about industrial size. Um, the machines are small sized. Uh, this has different reasons. One is the price. The second reason is the infrastructure needed. So the machines are running on a standard 220 or 110 volts, which is almost accessible anywhere. If you have bigger machines, you need different electricity, which is sometimes hard to get. Um, and it's also easier for shipping. So it's faster and lighter to go uh, anywhere. Before we go ahead with the questions, I will quickly uh, wrap up the, um, the presentation um, with the current uh, thing we are doing and producing. And that's also what's seen on the website. It's the, the face shields, um, which is something which is um, now during the COVID-19 crisis used as, as a protection. Uh, and at the moment produced mainly through 3D printers. Um, and we realized that we can produce it much more efficient um, with our machines than with the 3D printers. And that's again the process um, we can see now. And this works the same with any product. So this is now just shown with the face shields, but basically any other product you can think of which would work for our machine is the same. So at the beginning, we need a plastic waste. Um, we need a shredder, even uh, the industrial, of course, the industrial size. Um, or one of our solutions, then the granules come out, then you heat them, you inject them in the mold, and then you have a finished model or a finished product. And about the prices, which was also a question uh, at the moment, um, we, uh, for this specific case, uh, we sell it in packages. So you can get a feeling from the machines vary uh, from the hand shredder with 800 euros um, with injection machine, three, 4,000 euros, uh, up to 7,000 euros, depending on how you uh, connect them with each other and how you build your setup up. Um, and what's interesting for us is um, the, the green dots is in what countries we shipped in the last six months, basically, and where are some of our products in use at the moment. And the brown uh, dots those are the countries within the last two weeks um, which reached out to us or where we shipped the first uh, sets already to for this production. So this shows us that this local decentralized production, um, in this case of face shields, but in other cases of other products, um, is that there's a huge demand uh, and that, that many people are looking for it. Um, and yeah, we are now thinking, of course, in the future when there are no face shields, but the machines are around everywhere and are working on many different products like prosthesis, hydraulic ramp pumps, generator kits. So that basically there are a lot of useful products which arise out of the, the plastic waste. Um, and then I think there's a last a picture for us. So that's the whole team. So you see uh, Boris and Flo as well, besides Rafaela and me. Um, and now I think we are stopping the presentation and are jumping into the questions. If that's okay. Sure. Uh, here, Rafael, you were concerned that nobody would have any questions. And I think we're probably <laughs> going to run into overtime answering all these questions, huh? Probably. So should we just go ahead and-, and, and Please feel free. And I, I had some questions of my own. Uh, specifically tied to things that I think the particip participants should think about. I haven't seen them so far, but please feel free so that I'm just to go ahead, continue. Okay, so um, as the size res restrictions, um, of course there are limitations due to the machines. Um, so we say everything which is around this size basically uh, can be made with the injection machine. That's the one with the wheel. Um, and with the extruder, bigger objects can be made, but it always depends on the design, how they are made. Um, do you ship or assembly locally? So the machines, they come basically ready to use. They are designed in a way, like Rafaela mentioned, that everybody um, can set them up, that not, basically no knowledge is needed. Um, for it. There's a YouTube uh, video which solves the whole process of setting it up um, and it arrives basically you just need to put three bolts into it, raise it up and you can start production. 
Shipping is also interesting because from the beginning on when we are designing it, shipping was a key issue because it doesn't help you if you have a machine or something which works quite well um, if you cannot bring it in place or put it in place, especially if you think about regions where there might be no roads or, or just uh, no highways or something or trucks where just can just drive. Um, so the, the standard machines um, are shipped uh, in DHL package. So that's actually uh, the, the biggest package you can send. That's exactly what we hit with our, with our weight and size. Um, and so usually within 72 hours, the injection machine is everywhere in the world um, and can be ready for use. Um, how robust or strong can the material be? Um, so I guess that question is about the plastic waste which comes into it. So we are basically targeting household waste, um, which is laying around or broken. So plastic chairs, basins, uh, cups, plates, um, whatever uh, plastic waste, uh, household waste is, is out there. Um, of course, the machines again are small sized. So if you take a plastic chair, you first need to cut it with a saw to smaller pieces and then put it into the, the shredder. Uh, Sir, I can also help you digest sure. the questions uh, and, and filter them. I think maybe uh, going from, from top to bottom, one question um, was around sort of the, the harmful gases that might result from the production process and anything to share of how you deal with that? Yeah, I just read this one. Um, the interesting thing about plastic is if you heat it in the right temperature, um, fumes arise, of course, and you smell it's, it's plastic. Uh, but it's not, uh, if you use the right temperature and the right material, it's not dangerous uh, and uh, no, no pollution gets out. But if you burn it, um, then it's dangerous for health and for the environment. Um, and that's why it's also very important that the plastic is sorted beforehand, like Rafaela mentioned. So not throwing the bottle and the bottle lid, which is different plastics together in the machine, but to sort it out first um yeah to be able to be on the on the safe side and also not every plastic is possible to produce um due to uh for instance pvc um if you if you heat it um the fumes they can erase cancer and so we're not working with pvc for instance mm -hmm. I think there's two or three questions around um, recycling the recycled materials. So how, how often can you reuse um, the plastic that goes in and out of the process? Um, it depends a lot on, not on the plastic itself, but on the additives. So the additives is what makes plastic either resistant gegen UV or resistant uh, against some other uh, some other things or which bends the plastic and the problem is you never know what additives are in the plastic um, the plastic yourself you can identify but you cannot identify the additives in it so it's more a try and error especially with our our easy machines um, and if you recycle it a lot of times so we're talking about 10 15 times maybe um, you feel that the outcome is yeah, it's, it like breaks easier and so on. But that then comes with experience working with the machines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's one question by, by Kira uh, mentioning that you already produce a lot of products. Um, and, and I guess the participants are wondering not that they um, you know, come up with an idea that has already been implemented. Can you share a little bit of maybe the product categories that in your experience work really well or, or something that is still needed um, just to give them an overview of what you already have and what you might look for? Yeah, so the problem is, and that's why we're looking so much forward to this session, I think, um, that we, we don't really have 
good uh, products to track on local markets, I think. So what we have, for instance, uh, a, a customer in France, he ordered a flower pot because he is going on the ocean, collecting plastic waste, making small flower pots and selling them with ocean plastic and so on. So we created this mold. It was, the, I think, one of the first molds we ever made for specifically for this one person. And we sold the flower pot now in over 22 countries, not because the people need it, but because they don't know what else they should do. And they saw on our website or Instagram that this exists. And so for playing around a little bit, testing it and so on, they are producing it, but not because that's something they urgently need or they can make money with. Um, so what is happening is the school, are the school supplies in Uganda, because it's the only project we set up ourselves. So everything else are just people buying our machines and then they're doing whatever they want with it. Um, in Uganda, they're producing these rulers, abacus, um, letters, which is working quite well, or those school bags. Um, but I think besides that, we have some of these tiles, Rafael, or we saw in the, mm -hmm. in the presentation, but those are all just things somebody wanted or needed. And then people see that we have it and they also order it just because they're in the early stage and just trying out different things. So I think the face shields are now the first real product which has an impact or a real benefit, a scalable benefit to different uh, or in different areas. But I think we would look a lot forward um, yeah, to receiving or to working on solutions uh, in these interdisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and along those lines, Georg asked the question how it's possible to connect with somebody from um, local regions that could have a need. Um, so in our Slack channel, we do have um, a channel for introductions. So we would ask everyone to introduce themselves and then the European participants can also connect with participants from Southeast Asia um, through these um, conversations that are happening there. And, and we are also at the Slack channel and we will put there uh, some information, would try to answer your questions and uh, put some material and links there. So um, you, has, have the, uh, you have the opportunity to um, yeah, contact us, to talk with us and um, to see um, what, what we are doing. Um, and because there are so many branches, uh, we have ecotourism, there is empowerment, there is... Um, um, this um, for, for organization and prototyping so many fields that um, there are so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I could add something, especially looking at the challenge that the participants have, uh, something that we wouldn't necessarily think of right away, but the best solution is when we don't have to use your tools at all. What do I mean by that? That means that there is no plastic and we do not have this problem anymore. And so I wonder if maybe some of your activities, whether they look at the no plastic whatsoever. We are always discussed in, in groups and in uh, our awareness building in Austria with uh, students and kids and some other people and talked about this because um, it um, doesn't make any sense to, um, to put this uh, plastic waste in new circles without thinking about uh, to reduce it, to, um, to um, think circular. So our topic is always the circuit to empower and to, um, to uh, encourage the circular economy. But we see so much waste everywhere. So we know that it isn't a solution for long term to produce plastic and make waste out of it and um, to do this in circles, but there is so much plastic so that we see, okay, we have to um, yeah, take this waste out of the environment again. And there is so much, so we... we um, so, so just to add on it, definitely it's not a goal with our machines to take to waste and make new waste out of it, meaning a product mm -hmm. which is single use. So I think that the topic is not the, the plastic itself, but it's more uh, the single use topic uh, with the waste. Mm -hmm. and if it's possible to take the single waste or the single use, single use away um, and produce products uh, which can be used more often or have a longer lasting out of the waste, then that's definitely what we're looking for or striving for. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I would say that I don't think you're going to have any problems in not getting enough material in the near future. There, there's plenty of plastic out there. Uh, that being said, if we're talking about coming up with challenges for the participants, and if the goal is really no plastic or coming up with something that's biological that becomes nutrients and is brought back into the system, then I would think that would be part of our challenge here to come up with something even better. Uh, just to kind of piggyback on that of what you were saying, Sir and, and Rafaela, we, we talk a lot about closed loops. And of course, the, the shorter the loop, or sorry, the shorter the distance, the, the, the better your chances are of creating a closed loop. And so one thing that I think we always have to think about is when we're transporting the plastic from A to B, if we're creating a, C, a carbon footprint that's twice or three times the amount of the plastic, that's not quite the objective as well. So would you have any maybe uh, rules of thumb or things to think about for the participants that they should take into consideration coming up with ideas so it's really fit for purpose? Um, Rafaela? Yeah, we, we think about <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> starting and then I jumped in. <laughs> so, so we see actually and um, plastic waste as a, as a resource as a free resource for the local communities and so we see this um, not to produce products which are used at the other side of the world so we um, this production should be locally and should produce um, out of this waste products which are locally needed it doesn't make sense to produce something what you can what you should ship then uh, and another yeah another country uh, so this is local solution making and and to empower the people to create by their own and to find solutions for their local community and to build awareness about the plastic material because um actually um plastic waste gets burned or ends up in the environment or in the oceans and so we can build awareness too with this um yeah handling with with this plastic as a, a precious plastic not as a, a waste which should be burned apart from the fact that there was energy that was required to go ahead and create that plastic to begin yeah. with that needs to be part of our equation i think it was quite clear when looking at the slide that you you provided tied to all of the touch points where your products are to be found it's quite clear that you were looking at coming up with uh, placing them right where the plastic is to be found and not sending it all over the countryside. So that one was quite clear as well. But I, I, I raise this point because I think it's important for the participants not always to think technical, but also think logical and think goal oriented. In other words, the goal is really a world without plastic. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Thomas, you wanted uh, to go into No, the... I just wanted to pick up one more question, uh, and we'll pick up some more from the from the chats. Um, so Andre is asking, you know, how complex is it for somebody to learn how to use these machines? Um, can you share a little bit of the service that you provide in terms of empowering them also to to use the machines? And, and, so and... the technical aspect of it uh, is very simple. In those so those fifty or sixty machines we shipped in the last six months in around the world, um, all those people have learned by themselves uh, how to to operate the machines. So there's this four minute or, or five minute YouTube link on our web or on our YouTube channel um, where every machine from unpacking it uh, until the finished product is out there. Um, so it's very simple. And you probably need less than two or three hours to play around a little bit with the guidance. And there's, of course, a manual people get from us. Um, and then you can already produce. Um, as a service, as a company, we do also offer the on-site trainings or, of course, the, the online training as well, um, which is on the technical side uh, not that much needed rather needed in the entrepreneurial part around. Because mm -hmm. like we mentioned, actually we are placing the machine somewhere, it doesn't help anything. But the first step is to think what would the machine help in that area or what could be made in that area with the machine. And that's actually the, the service or the support, which is 
much more important for us um, than the technical aspect. Mm -hmm. There's one or two questions around the technical aspects. Can you maybe just uh, for the uninitiated explain how, how does it work with the molds? Like how, how complex is to cre it create a new mold? That was one of the questions. And then uh, somebody else asked more about the extruder. Um, so maybe can you just break down um, some of the foundations of, of how this would work? If, if a participant has an idea to produce something, what would be the next steps to get these molds and then to get the machines to work? So there are different ways uh, how to produce the molds. Um, the best way for a, a, a small scale production or a batch production is to CNC mill them out of aluminum, um, which of course needs first the design of the product, a 3D model, which is then converted into the mold, which is then converted into the CNC mill and milling aspect. Um, there are much easier ways um, to use clay or concrete and to make, a, I don't know, Thomas need to help me, a negative abdruck. A reverse, I don't know, Mike, uh, he's our native speaker. Uh, I, I'm struggling, just, just a, sorry. A model. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But it's something that you have like- It's a, inversed. Yeah, inversed yeah. would be the word I would think. Mm. And you take, you take the object, put it in, take it out, mm -hmm. and then you can basically uh, inject it. Mm -hmm. um, there are different ways. You can laser cut it, you can water cut the molds. Um, you can take wood and a saw. And we will, I think, for all these technical aspects, uh, as well for the details of sizes and how much, we will share with you our like data sheets for each machine. So there are all the sizes and, and everything in it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question I just saw uh, as for medical use and standards and so on. For instance, these face shields, they are certified, uh, not for medical use due to time, but CE certified uh, protective equip personal protective equipment, um, category one, um, doesn't matter, but it's not the problem of the machines uh, or the process um, to certify it. The problem of the certification is that because we are taking waste um, and you don't know what happened with that waste, where was it laying around, um, it's hard to certify the product then because actually every product which comes out of the waste is unique. Um, and so for instance, for the face shields, we are sourcing recycled plastic from the industry because they have it in tons and they have data sheets and they know exactly what it is. If you go now around the streets collecting the waste, um, it's very hard uh, to certify the product at the end because you never know what's really in there. Mm -hmm. Are there any other legal uh, considerations participants should keep in mind as they craft their ideas? So food is one thing. So, mm. um, I mean, we have in Uganda, for instance, uh, and in, in Kenya projects where they produce plates. Um, the industry in Austria, as well as the legal part, they say in, in Austria and Europe, you would never be able to do it because of the certification problem. Um, but from the health aspect, um, it's no problem at all. Because if it is a milk bottle and there was milk in it and you drank it, and now you make out of the bottle a cup or a plate, um, due to the process, nothing happens if it. it's not getting changed, so it's still okay. But due to the documentation process and so on, so we uh, suggest rather not looking into food safe products, because then if you sell it on the market, uh, there might be issues or troubles um, due to different regions in the world or, or standards which are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have an, a, a question by Anu Palmer around other categories, clothing, shoes. Um, you mentioned there's a different process to take sort of the soft plastic and, and create the layers for the backpack. Um, anything to share on this question? Yeah, for example, the, the process for create this material is you, we used um, um, plastic bags, for example, we, we made out of um, bags out of it, school bags, um, little bags, big bags, everything. And you put um, a baking paper at the ground, then you um, take some two or three um, plastic bags cut it in form like a 
like on this size, and then an, another uh, baking paper on the top, and then you take the iron and um, heat it over there. So um, you they melt together, but they have to be the same material. Instead of that, so you create waste, not uh, what cannot be recycled again. And then you can um, take this material and make bags out of it with an um, was, ne machine? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> a sewing, sewing machine. machine. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, mm, thanks. It's very easy. Yeah. Another question we had earlier from Mirza was around um, whether you have more interest or experience with B2B versus B2C. Uh, like, do you have examples where other companies are uh, the buyers of the products that are being created? Uh, or is it more consumer oriented goods that are produced? Yeah, we have a big variety, variety in the in the stakeholders and the people which are using the machines because we have um, universities, schools, and and for example, Axel in, in France, he's a surfer. He um, puts out the waste of the beach and creates products out of it, what Søren said. And so we have um, nonprofit co um, companies where we are talking about to implement in other, country, in other countries, companies, which are interested in and with the face shields um, um, people yeah all around us in Austria and other countries but CERN what would you say um, ecotourism for example no? oh for sure we're selling b2b for instance the face shields they're mainly sold b2b in Austria mm -hmm. um, but our customers themselves um, they do both they sell b2b on the market as well as b2c mm -hmm. With regards to the markets, we had a few questions around the geography, like um, are you mainly targeting the global south or what if one uh, or more participants come up with ideas for doing things in Vienna, that's quite open, right? Yeah, I think we, we have from the south, from many different countries. So there are always another, um, you have other plastic waste out of out there. So other qualities of the waste. So first we have always to look around which waste, which waste is there and what we can make out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And Teddy, to your question, we'll post that on Slack. Uh, what else am I missing? Mike, do you see other questions that I went over? No, I think most of them uh, concern specific technical details and the we will definitely go ahead and ensure that all that the information, not just the questions that you pose here, but any questions you might have moving forward, that we will provide all of that information on the, on the Slack channel. Mm. I think that's probably the most important thing because inevitably once our participants get involved and start trying to come up with ideas, I think that's when the real questions are going to come. Mm. Uh, we'll, we'll share the link also to the Slack channel. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, is there anything else, uh, CERN? Now, Feda, that we should mention to the participants, they should one, keep in mind. One very important thing, I don't know if we mentioned already, um, is the problem with PET bottles, meaning the plastic bottles themselves, so that, um, which is a majority of our waste, that due to the characteristics of PET, which is the plastic uh, in these bottles, they cannot be turned into new products with our machines. So we're basically talking about every other plastic which is laying around except the bottles, which is often a bit uh, disappointing for a lot of people, but it's very complicated and, uh, and needed very technology behind it to preheat it, crystallize it and so on. So it's not just something you can make to flakes and then throw it into it. That's something we are working on currently or in the future. Um, but if you think of the waste streams uh, in your area or around you, then the, the bottles are sadly something which we cannot use. The lids um, for closing the bottles, they are perfect. That's the best plastic which is there. 
And, and, and one, one thing to also keep in mind for all the participants, um, we explicitly said the idea should be both for new products, but also for the business model around it. So as you create your ideas, think about, you know, how should this create value, but also how should it capture value to create systems that will transform um, the usage of, of waste as resources. Um, I think Rafaela mentioned that you guys always think in terms of the services to be provided, um, the rooms where this should take place, um, the systems that need to come into play, and then the products that are produced. So um, I would encourage all the participants to really think holistically about all the different uh, pieces that need to work together in order to make this work for local plastic printers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just to add on this maybe briefly is that this waste picking or waste management system are really popular at the moment. So in, in many countries, as well as in Asia, as in Africa and South America, um, apps or, or different uh, types arrays where people are collecting waste, bringing somewhere and they get either a voucher for something or some money or anything else. But then they never know what to do with the plastic. It's then just getting collected and then sold to the industry or just stored in huge places because nobody knows what to do it. So it might be also interesting to look in your areas what kind of waste collecting initiatives or solutions are out there which have access to the resources, which have the material, um, and they can add like more to it with the machines. They cannot process tons of our machines because they're no industrial size. So the, the standard waste stream and income stream for these people will always be the waste picking and selling of waste, but it can be added to it um, as well as on the financial and business side, also on the product side. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a danger, especially when coming up with a business model. If you don't watch out, it might actually create more plastic. There was a case study that came out of the Philippines, specifically tied to Unilever, where they added that incentive to it that you were talking about. And in fact, that gave the people more of an incentive to go ahead and, and produce plastic waste. <laughs> so we have to be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I just shared the link to Slack in the chat. So um, I know there's more technical questions that uh, come up, but I, I want to make sure that we also address uh, the next steps um, with regards to the inspiration phase that we're entering. Um, so uh, we're asking all the participants to create a two minute video where you introduce your idea or an insight relevant to the challenge. And, and this idea um, will be shared through Spring Phase. Um, you will get an invite uh, at the latest by Monday um, to then, or Tuesday, early in the week, um, <laughs> to... No comment, Thomas. Uh, <laughs> no comment. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Would you say, Martha, will... Wednesday? Okay. I would say Wednesday. <laughs> it takes so long. <laughs> Just get ready to upload. No, what, what you, all, all you need to do, some of you already asked, um, we're setting up this um, inspiration space within um, Spring Base. That's the platform they will use. For now, all you have to do is register on the website, um, the short Airtable form. Uh, once we have your email, then we'll invite you to Spring Base and there um, you can upload your two minute video. Um, so for the um, for the video, it's, it's really about the idea or the insight you want to share, um, not only about the, the quality of the video. So uh, we're using these inspiration videos tend to form groups. So we would like to have um, different skills come together in the teams. So each team ideally should have somebody with a business background, somebody with a technical background, somebody with a design background, so that each team has the skills needed to create a great idea and turn that into a compelling prototype. Um, we do have um, different groups of participants. Um, we have participants from the Technical University in Berlin. Uh, we have business students from um, the VU in Vienna. And then we have um, 
participants from the Southeast Asian network of the East-West Center. So um, to the earlier question of how you identify potential team members or interview partners, um, let's use the Slack introduction channel to get to know each other. Um, and as you submit your inspiration video, you can say, I would like to be in the group with so-and-so, um, and then we will form the teams according to the best ideas, as well as the diversity of backgrounds so that we can um, have the right skills in the team. And then if there's an idea, let's say for Indonesia, we wanna make sure that we also have uh, obviously members from Indonesia represented in this group. So you can use the introduction channel on Slack to make connections, to already share your thoughts, your ideas, um, get feedback. Uh, Fela and, and CERN will also be part of the Slack group. So there um, you can um, shape your ideas before you submit them on sprint base. And the deadline for the submission is May 7th. So you have about a week to think about your idea, your insight, share that. And then um, we will let you know who will be the, the team leaders who is then expected to pitch the idea during the opening on May 13th um, in a two minute pitch in front of our mentors, our company partners and the other teams. Do you have any, any questions on the InnoDays, how it works? Um, please ask them now or also on Slack later. Thomas, I think there was one question coming through. How large can a team be or how large should a team be? Good question. So um, usually our team size is four or five. Um, so let's, let's plan with that for now. Um, if we have um, way above 100 participants, we might extend it to six participants, uh, but we'll let you know, but usually four or five. Yeah. Um, so um, all, all you have to do as a participant, for those of you who you are confused, um, just go to the website, innodays.org slash um, circular economy 2020. Um, you sign up um, by filling out the form and then um, until early okay. next week, you'll get an invite access, Mr. to sprint base. And then um, there you submit your video. So two steps. Um, first is register, and the second one is prepare your inspiration video. Okay. Good. Any other questions from anyone? I think um, the key here is understanding the timelines, the actions and the timelines. Thank you very much for uh, explaining that one, Thomas. Mm. Yeah, and also the, the timeline is on the website. Um, so you can see the three um, steps preparing, um, just thinking about the challenge. Um, a great way would also be to start with talking with potential customers of your solution. Um, so um, doing this customer development that some of the uh, students participating um, are starting to do. Um, they are getting inspiration from different sources and um, getting ready with your idea. Hello. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so from, our, uh, from our side, uh, I would uh, like to say, um, yeah, at this point, thank you that you are participating and that you, um, yeah, we think we together we can make the change and we uh, can create impact and make systems change. Because um, if we're not thinking in our little boxes um, and think a bigger view at the world, um, then we can make plastic circular. That's our slogan. So not to, to think about, okay, uh, there are so many fields in the circular economy. That's refurbishment. That's um, a reuse of products. But in this topic, we have this as recycling as the main topic. And to make this uh, at to to create an yeah the best out of it what exists and there are so much plastic waste out there and now we have to 
yeah, take it out of the environment and make the best out of it. So thank you all that you joined maybe, this challenge. Maybe if I can piggyback on that of what you said, Rafael, um, the in comparison to a lot of hackathons that we that we have out there, there's a real possibility of making an impact with that of what is coming through. And I think that's what you were clearly alluding to there, Rafaela. And so take that as a, a source of, of inspiration to see whether we can actually come up with something and clearly make a difference. And from that perspective, it obviously it makes all that of what we're trying to do here very, very exciting and a, a unique opportunity to actually go ahead and see that of what we, we come up with, watch it take place. And so that's the, that's the challenge and that's the goal. And for me, that's clearly the reward. Anything you'd like to add from your side, Thomas? No, those are great um, words to end. Yeah, thanks to the team of Plaskner, Rafael and Søren for sharing more about the challenge and your expertise and, and experience. Um, thanks, Mike, for um, running the conversation. And thanks to all of the participants for listening in. Uh, we look forward to um, see you when we kick off the Inno Days on, on May 13. And in the meantime, uh, we'll be in touch uh, through Slack. If you have any questions, let's use this forum then to answer them and to have this inspiration phase to come up with great ideas that, as, as Rafael and Michael said, will, will make a positive impact by transforming the way we deal and think about plastic. So thanks to everyone for joining. We're Looking forward to the event. Yeah, and thank you very much all for attending today. We're very appreciative. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs> we didn't even get to the this part, Rafael. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll take group pictures then at the, at the event or... I don't know whether it's easier when when uh, we have a uh, video uh, pictures there because when there are only names, it's not possible. <laughs> maybe we'll otherwise, we'd just a... be waving at each other the whole time. What do you say, Rafael? <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe we can do it with everyone quickly. If if each one of you can turn on the video, um, we'll we'll take a, a group photo here, um, and then we use that as a stress test for um, <laughs> the technology because for the opening, we want to then have you yeah, so many with the camera. Makes it more um, personal, yeah. Oh, of course. Thank you. So we see each other. Oh, so we uh, see uh, many thank you. of you. <laughs> yeah, and it's great to see also a diverse group. I think we have yeah. uh, people dialing in from um, from Austria, from, from Germany, from Southeast Asia, right? So um, it's great to, to see everyone. And yeah, we'll... I think we'll have a great event. Yeah, so I will share a few of the of the photos um, on our social channels, and then yeah, we're um, ending now. For those uh, who are dialing in from the Technical University in Berlin, we'll start our session in uh, a few minutes on the other channel. Yeah, you might need a couple of minutes to get ready for 1700, Thomas, when you say. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you Just in time. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Have a good evening or rest of the day. Good night, wherever you are. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>